Savages are not more noble. There is to be found in African students of political economy, Siamese at Oxford, and more generally in diligent art historians and musicologists of petty bourgeois origins, a ready inclination to combine with the assimilation of new material an inordinate respect for all that is established, accepted, acknowledged. An uncompromising mind is the very opposite of primitivism, neophytism, or the non-capitalist world. It presupposes experience, a historical memory, a fastidious intellect, and above all, an ample measure of satiety. I'm obviously pronouncing that wrong, though. I don't know. It has been observed time and again how these recruited young and innocent to radical groups have defected once they felt the force of tradition. One must have tradition in oneself to hate it properly. That snobs show more aptitude than proletarians for avant-garde movements in art shows light on politics or throws light on politics too. Latecomers and newcomers have an alarming affinity to positivism from Carnap worshippers in India to the stalwart defenders of the German masters Matthias Grunwald and Heinrich Schutz. It would be poor psychology to assume that exclusion arouses only hate and resentment. It arouses, too, a possessive, intolerant kind of love, and those whom repressive culture has held at a distance can easily enough become its most die-hard defenders. There is even an echo of this in the sententious language of the worker who wants, as a socialist, to learn something, to partake of the so-called heritage, and the Philistinism of the Bebels lies less in their incomprehension of culture than, than in the alacrity with which they accept it at face value, identify with it, and in so doing, of course, reverse its meaning. Socialism is in general no more secure against this transformation than against lapsing theoretically into positivism. It can happen easily enough that in the Far East, Marx is put in the place vacated by Dreitsch and Rickert. There is some reason to fear that the involvement of non-Western peoples in the conflicts of industrial society, long overdue in itself, will be less to the benefit of the liberated peoples than to that of rationally improved production and communications, and a modestly raised standard of living. Instead of expecting miracles of the pre-capitalist peoples, older nations should be on their guard against their unimaginative, indolent taste for everything proven and for the the successes of the West.